Good morning, church. It's good to see you all. Thank you, Hank, for that prayer. God bless you. <clears throat> we'll be going through a series called The Reason for God. A series was kicked off last week, and it's really a... It, 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 it's, it's, it's really a... You're going to get in four parts what we've been doing for the last two years with the apologetics uh, club that Pace has started over at AAA. And every single time I get into this mode of like teaching and, and I get into this mode of like speaking about history, philosophy, and theology, my wife usually gives me a tap on the shoulder and just kind of warns me. She always warns me every time I start going down that track and she would always say Rome kiss keep it simple sister and here's the thing right <clears throat> when I was over at the uh, the academy and I would uh, sit there with some of these students and in class I'm I, I love it because I, I get to say a lot of things in those classes and and they get it because they're reading about a lot of this stuff. You know, from us, for, for, for some of us who are here today, we're so far removed from those textbooks. For our students, they're reading them. Even when they don't want to read them, they're reading them. And what's most interesting for me uh, is that some of, these, some of these men that are no longer alive today, these old gray heads that are no longer alive today, they're not alive today, but their ideas are still with us. And, and many of their ideas are with our young people. The problem is our young people don't know that they're quoting these ideas that come from some of these guys. Most of the people that your children will be quoting in today's culture, uh, two Germans and two French. Uh, the two Germans would be Frederick Nietzsche and Karl Marx. The two French would be Jean-Paul Sartre and Michel Foucault. And the funny thing is, is that they'll be watching them, they see it in the advertisements, they see it in the movies, they hear it in the music, and they don't know where they come from. And sometimes I keep hearing people saying, what's your why? Tell us your why. Thinking it was Simon Steck. It's Friedrich Nietzsche, who had an influence on... Victor Frankl, I mean, Frederick Nietzsche, actually the full quote is, is, with a why you can deal with almost any how. And so when you hear these young people quoting things, like they say things like, YOLO, you only live once, Michel Foucault. I'm like, dude, a lot of these things that you hear in movies today, like there's a, there's a movie that, 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 that just came out, and my wife cannot stand the movie because it's just chaos. And it's up there to win all these awards. And, and the, the whole movie is about absurdity. And I'm like looking at it and I'm going, huh, another French, Albert Camus. I'm like, this stuff is everywhere. Ideas have a way of shaping culture. And if we don't understand what these ideas have caused, if we don't know our own history, we can be in danger of repeating history. And we are right now in a time where we're starting to see these ideas resurfacing. These ideas were once in Europe, but now right here in your backyard. Right in your backyard. And so as we go into this series, and, 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 you know, I'm looking at my wife and I said, you know what, Pace and Arnett has given me permission in this series, the reason for God, to do a little reasoning with you today. And I'm just going to ask you if you can give me the same permission to be able to do this with you. A little less preaching, probably a little more conversation and teaching. Stay with me, fasten your seatbelts. I'll take you through a bit of history. But before we get into that, I want to give you a bit of background about how God led me into ministry, how God led me 
to where I am today. When I began my quest for the pursuit of truth, my world was just coming back from being in that dark place, that dark place of depression. I don't know if you've been there before. That dark place where you start asking the question, is there any meaning to my life? Where you start asking questions, would the world miss me if I disappeared today? I thought life had no meaning. But what restored that for me was a four-letter word, love. I was reunited with my son. I was reunited with my wife. I was reunited with my father. I felt loved and I knew what it meant to love. I wanted to know if there was any purpose for my life. And I would talk to my father about this. Is there any purpose to life? And it would frustrate me when he would give me one answer, one word answer, a name, Jesus. He'd just say, Jesus. I was not particularly interested in anything spiritual at the time because I was content with just being agnostic. I was content with just doing my thing. You do your thing, and I'll do my thing. You believe what you want to believe, I believe what I want to believe. You can be spiritual, just be spiritual somewhere else. But I was curious, and curiosity led me to look into Christianity from a historical perspective to find out if there was any truth to the person of Jesus. I looked into history through the lenses of Will Durant's 13 volume, The Story of Civilization. I had asked my wife one day if she could get me that volume, and she looked at me and thought, what happened to my husband? But I, I, I was full of questions, and I wanted to know answers, and, 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 and I don't want to read too many books. I just, I just want somebody that has credibility, and, and I could just read through these books like a library and, and kind of piece things together. How do we get here? What is civilization? What is it all about? What is politics? What does it mean? What is Christianity? What, is it all, what does it all mean? Two books of history that I would come to read is the story of civilization and Augustine's city of God. What I discovered led me to where I am today. What I, what I discovered while pursuing these truths led me to where I am today. It's to a point where this hill I'm willing to die on. What I discovered led me to say, I am willing to depart from anything and everything that was getting in my way to pursuing what I believe to be truth and what I believe was the purpose for my own life. Let's pray. Father, as we pause, we just ask for your blessings and we ask, Lord, for your wisdom and your guidance. And I just pray that you'll be with me, Lord. Help me, Lord, to speak your word here today and help us to be challenged, Lord. Help us to be challenged in our Christianity. Help us to be challenged in our Adventism. Help us to be challenged, Lord, to relook at your book, to relook at our ways, to relook, to rethink and reevaluate, Lord, the way of Christianity and the person of Jesus Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Let everyone say, Amen. Now, if you know me, I'm not somebody that likes to use slides, but I figured if I'm going to like help you stay with me in this, this, this road of history and theology and philosophy I'm going to take you through, uh, I'll have some slides so that you, know, you can stay with me. Uh, at least it'll help us stay on track because I'm really bad at staying on track sometimes. If you were to see some of my notes and when I preach, you'd think like, Rome, where's this half? You went that way. I'm so glad you don't get to see my notes. But, okay, there's a text in the Bible. The text in the Bible, and it's found in Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 and verse 20. Romans chapter 1 and verse 20, and it says this. I'm going to read from the, the text that I have up here. All the texts that I'll be using is NIV. And Romans chapter 1, verse 20 says, For since the creation of the world, 
God's invisible, what word did I say? Invisible qualities, his eternal and divine nature have been clearly, what's that word? Seen, has been clearly what church? Clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without what? So that people are without excuse. For centuries, the ancient world believed in gods. Most ancient civilizations believed in God. Being Samoan, I grew up where it was not polytheistic or monotheistic, it was pantheistic. God was in everything. But you couldn't find a civilization that believed in absolutely nothing. You couldn't find an ancient civilization that believed in zero. That, that nothing would bring about nothing. That is, of course, until the Greeks came onto the scene. And when the Greeks came onto the scene, the Greeks were spread out throughout what would be today Greece and one area, Turkey, which back then was called Ionia. We had Greeks there called the Ionian Greeks. Over in southern Italy, you had the Italian Greeks. And the Ionian Greeks decided that they were going to abandon the idea of gods. They were shifting from a mythos period to a phylos period. They were abandoning the idea of God because they weren't satisfied with the beliefs. They weren't satisfied with what the gods were giving them. And mainly because when they studied and they looked at these gods, they, believed, they, they started to look at the behavior of these gods. How many of you have read Greek mythology? And if you read some of their stories, these, these Greeks came to the conclusion, these guys behave just like us. They're liars. They're thieves. They're murderers. And the Ionian Greeks came to, a, came to a point where they said, they didn't create us. We created them. They were the first to depart from the ideas of gods. And they began to look into nature and they were looking into nature because they were hoping to find the single element the archon they were looking for that would bring about all of human life and the Ionian Greeks began to debate each other over which of these elements brought life one of those guys his name was Thales Thales said it was water Heraclides said it was fire. I could sit here all day and go through each of these philosophers of the Ionian. What they all came up with is that whatever the element was, it was material. It was nature. In comes your naturalists. And these naturalists began to explore nature to find out where did all life come from. By the way, that guy Heraclides is where John borrowed the word logos from. Heraclides saw that there was a force in nature that put everything in order, and he called that thing logos, which would later be borrowed by John, and John would use that to say that that logos became flesh. But then they were challenged. The Ionian Greeks were challenged by the Italian Greeks. And the Italian Greeks said to the Ionian Greeks, you guys got it all wrong. It's not material. It's actually immaterial. It's actually abstractions. It's actually spiritual. Thinkers like Pythagoras. And you're probably thinking, who in the world is Pythagoras? Our students knew who Pythagoras is. That's where we get the Pythagorean theorem from. Pythagoras said, it's not in nature, it's not material. Pythagoras said, it's, in, it's something spiritual. It's, it's numbers. I had a student once say to me one time, and he said, Rome, I need something that, I mean, you're telling me to believe, but like, give me an example of something rational that we can believe, something logical that we can believe, but we can't touch, smell, feel. Give me an example. I said, numbers. He was caught off guard. Barring Pythagoras' idea, he says, numbers are the most powerful thing in the world. Numbers rule the world. Objects exist just to represent numbers. There's a powerful idea in that. 
Another Italian Greek who kind of messed things up, if you've ever read him before, it'll mess your thinking up, is a guy by the name of Parmenides, and Parmenides had a student named Zeno. You wouldn't understand Parmenides if you were to read him. You have to read Zeno to understand Parmenides. And Zeno would say about Parmenides, everything is an illusion. You think you're here. The only thing that tells you that you're here is your senses. How do you know you're not a butterfly dreaming you're a human being sitting in church today? I said that to one of my students, and one of the students across the road said, Rome, stop! Stop! Parmenides would go on to teach this, and there was this massive argument between the Greeks in society. They were arguing, is it material or immaterial? Is it spiritual or is it physical? Is it corporeal or is it incorporeal? What is it? And they began to battle each other out, and as they were battling each other out, they couldn't come to, a, they couldn't come to an answer, and that created an impasse in history. And every single time an impasse is created in history, skepticism is the result. And when they couldn't deal with the biggest questions of life, they decided, well, we don't care about the big questions of life anymore. We just care about the simple things in life. Like, how can I be happy? How can I just, where can I find pleasure, eternal pleasure, without hedonism? How, how, can, I, how can I go through life and, and find meaning, like, like easy meaning? <laughs> Something simple. And as they were battling each other, skepticism came out, and the one who ended that skepticism, the one who would come to the scene and end that skepticism, a guy by the name of Plato. Plato comes onto the scene and Plato says, guys, here's the Platonic synthesis. They're both right. It is both corporeal and incorporeal. It's both material and immaterial. For, for Plato, I'm going to guess, it, it's going to be 75% material, uh, immaterial, and 25% material. Plato says it was more spiritual than it is material. He said, focus your life on things that are spiritual because the things that are material are evil. The things that are material are just shadows. Notice the language in the New Testament. A lot of this language was borrowed from these guys. From him, the idea that the body was evil and the soul was the only thing good is still around today, some of these beliefs. And so Plato kind of ended this time of skepticism and everybody came to believe that Plato has figured out all the questions of life until another guy came onto the scene and made things worse. Well, you can say worse, but I think the other guy that came onto the scene, the guy by the name of Aristotle, his own student, and Aristotle comes onto the scene and Aristotle says, no, Plato, you're wrong. It's actually more material than it is spiritual. He's the great scientist. Aristotle was the one that was arguing with Plato, saying, Plato, come on, man. You talk about things in the ideal world. Can you actually bring some of those things in the ideal world into the real world so I can measure it, weigh it, so I can test it? And as these two argued it out, they split things up. And you know what? Plato will always be pointing up. Aristotle will always be pointing down. And there's this famous painting. I don't know if you've seen this painting before. The, the, the painting of all these great philosophers, I think it's Raphael that paints this uh, Renaissance painting. And what you see there in the, in, in the red or pinkish color there is Plato. Where's he pointing? He's pointing up. He says everything's about the ideal. But if you look at the guy next to him, the, the guy in the blue, where's he pointing? He's pointing down, but he has like five fingers pointing down. Uh, one person says he's talking about the five senses. All truth is weighed empirically five fingers down he says if i can't taste it if i can't see it if i can't feel it if i can't see it if i can't hear it it's not true and so they had this 
argument out. And it created another era of skepticism. And that skepticism was brought to an end when a guy by the name of Paul enters the scene. And Paul comes in with the good news. And Paul gives them both what they're looking for. Paul, with the Christian synthesis, gives Plato what he's looking for. Plato is more about the ideal world, and Aristotle is more about the material world. And Paul gives them Christianity, and Christianity gives us this. 1 John, 1 John chapter 1 says, That which was from the beginning which we have heard, that's ontological, that's rational, that's what Plato was looking for. Says, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this is what Aristotle was looking for. Something that was empirically verifiable. He wanted to touch it. And John says, Jesus, who comes from the ideal world. Plato, let me give you a, let me give you a hand with that. Let me help you with that. Jesus is perfection, stepped into our imperfect world. And so we have this picture of Jesus, the stories of Jesus, the Christian synthesis, ended skepticism, and for a very long time throughout history, every philosophy had to deal with the person of Jesus. Every single person had to wrestle with the person of Jesus for a very long time after that. Guys like Augustine had to wrestle with Jesus. Guys like Anselm had to wrestle with Jesus. Guys like Thomas Aquinas. All of them would use the Platonic and Aristotelian argument to help the world understand their theology. But something happens in history. And remember, God never allows things to happen without warning his church. God warned us in, Dave, uh, in, in the book of Daniel, and God warned us in Revelation, particularly Revelation chapter 9 and verse 1 to 11, the fifth trumpet, that the church would fail us and something else would rise. What happened is Jesus was no longer the center of Christianity. Christianity became corrupted by men who lusted for power and control. It was a misrepresentation of God. Do you know, we have made more atheists out of misrepresenting God than the Big Bang Theory. We have made more atheists because of our treatment of others, because of our treatment of people, more people in my circle of friends are turned off Christianity. And when you ask them, it's not because they read the book, it's because they've seen the way Christians behaved throughout history. Christianity was used by the government as a way to gain favor with the masses and use it as a justification for the many atrocities that would be, that would be committed by the church throughout the medieval period. Christianity went from being persecuted to being the persecutor. This is always the pattern in history. Thank you. This is always the pattern in history when the pendulum swings hard in one direction. At some point, it will swing hard also in the opposite direction. We saw the church and state come together. The corruption of the theocracy, the corruption of the ecclesiocracy, the corruption of the church. But the French Revolution put an end to that. The French Revolution opened the gate to the de-Christianization of Europe. The Enlightenment, humanism, which was always at the heart of the Renaissance. Christianity had lost its purpose and reason. The 19th century was the century where Christianity was put on trial. 
The 5th century BC, the Greek philosophers put ancient pagan gods on trial and turned to rationalism and empiricism to define truth. And now rationalism and empiricism is placing God on trial for the sins of the church. The 19th century came as a way of preparing our world today for the culture that we are now in. The 19th century prepared us for that. Three major attacks on Christianity. The first major attack on Christianity came by a guy by the name of David Strauss. The person that you see behind me was a German theologian who wrote his famous Life of Jesus in 1835 where he began to look at the historicity of Jesus and question Jesus to the point where he went deep in his argument to convince many people that Jesus Christ was a myth. The idea that Jesus Christ never really existed was first made popular by this German theologian by the name of David Friedrich Strauss. The second German that would come onto the scene and smash Christianity is a guy by the name of Karl Marx. And Karl Marx was attacking capitalism, capitalism which was put in place by the Protestants. Karl Marx believed that there was this superstructure and there was a base and he wanted to really expose that base by attacking the superstructure which he believed was religion it was at that point that Karl Marx made that statement that religion was the opium of the masses and then the one who would come in and put the nail in the coffin was this guy by the name of Charles who Charles Darwin Charles Darwin would come in and question the existence of God. Charles Darwin would come in and bring about what we would know today as natural selection. The idea of evolution. Three of these guys in the 19th century, their ideas were taken seriously in the 20th century, but they were talking about this in the 19th century. And the person that was around in the 19th century that heard all of this stuff happening was another atheist German that was worried. He was worried about these ideas. He was worried about having a world of no Jesus. He was worried about having a world of no God. He was worried that meaning and significance, all of that was going to go out the window because this German philosopher was asking, if we remove Christianity which were the pillars of Western civilization. If we remove those pillars, what are we going to put there in its place? And he was worried about that. Friedrich Nietzsche, born in 1844, but died in 1900, never got to see. But he made a prophecy, and his prophecy was told in a parable. I love parables. Jesus tells stories in order for us to grapple with some of the deepest things of life. And Friedrich Nietzsche wanted us to grapple with something deep. And he told a story in his book, The Gay Science, The Gay Sciences, tells a story about this madman who he likened to be like a Diogenes. Diogenes was a skeptic. And he likens this madman and he says this, Whither is God? He cried. I will tell you. And just before I give you a bit of back, uh, just before I read this, you have to understand the background of the story. This madman wakes up in the morning, where's the lantern? Grabs this lantern and decides to go into the marketplace. And he was going to go into the marketplace to make a prophetic announcement. And all these people were at the marketplace. And this madman went to the marketplace and he yelled out these words, Whither is God? He cried. I tell you, we have killed him. You and I, all of us are his murderers. But how did we do this? How could we drink up the sea? Who gave us the sponge to wipe away the entire horizon? What were we doing when we unchained this earth from its sun? Whither is it moving now? 
Whither are we moving? In other words, where are we moving? Away from all sons? Are we not plunging continually backward, sideways, forward, in all direction? Is there still any up or down? Are we not straying as through an infinite nothing? Do we hear nothing as yet of the noise of the grave diggers who are burying God? Do we smell nothing yet of the divine decomposition? God's too decompose. God is dead. God remains dead. And we have killed him. How shall we comfort ourselves, the murderers of all murderers? Here the madman fell silent and looked again at his listeners. Everyone that was mocking the madman, they stopped. They were all quiet, looking at this madman. And looked again at his listeners, and they, they too were silent, and they stared at him in astonishment. And at last, he threw his lantern on the ground, and it broke into pieces and went out. He says, I've come too early. He said then, my time is not yet. Frederick Nietzsche wrote this in the 19th century. He said that the next century, if we were to take seriously the ideas of Karl Marx, the ideas of David Strauss, the ideas of Charles Darwin, if we were to take these ideas seriously, we are going to see the bloodiest century. And the 20th century came around and indeed, the 20th century was the bloodiest century of all centuries, of all 19th centuries put together. None was worse than the 20th century when we began to take seriously the ideas. Frederick Nietzsche called this idea nihilism. Nihilism is the belief that all values are baseless and that nothing can be known or communicated. It is often associated with extreme pessimism and a radical skepticism that condemns existence. A true nihilist would believe in nothing, have no loyalties, have no purpose other than perhaps an impulse to destroy. Frederick Nietzsche was right. The ideas of Strauss, Marx, and Darwin were taken seriously by Nazi Germany, was taken seriously by Stalin, it was taken seriously by Mao, and in just one century, we killed millions of people. And I want you to notice what Viktor Frankl says in his book. And Viktor Frankl was a psychiatrist who was also in Auschwitz. He was also a Holocaust survivor. He said these words. He said... If we present man, if we present man with a concept of man which is not true, we may well corrupt him. When we present man as an automaton of reflexes, as a mind machine, as a bundle of instincts, as a pawn of drives and reactions, as a mere product of heredity and environment, when we feel when we feed the nihilism to which he is already prone, I became acquainted with the last stage of that corruption in my second concentration camp, Auschwitz. The gas chambers of Auschwitz were the ultimate consequences of the theory that man is nothing. But the product of heredity and environment, or as the Nazis like to say, man was just blood and soil, I am absolutely convinced that the gas chambers of Auschwitz were ultimately prepared not in some ministry or other in Berlin, but rather at the desks and lecture hall of nihilistic scientists and philosophers. You think ideas have consequences? Out of the ashes, though, of nihilism came two ideas existentialism and absurdism. Jean-Paul Sartre, an existentialist philosopher, went from saying 
there is no meaning to life. You don't look for the meaning of life. What you ought to do is discover the meaning of your own life. In other words, you create your own meaning. Before such, there's the idea of essence before existence. You have a purpose before you exist. It was flipped by Sart when he says, no, you have no purpose. You exist first, find your own purpose. Absurdism, Albert Camus looked at absurdism and he says, look at life. Life has no meaning. Do you realize that we're just here by chance? Do you realize that the earth is 14.7 billion years old? The universe is 14.7 billion years old. The earth is four and a half billion years old. That time we created, time is not actually, we created time. And he says time is just a way of measuring the past. Life is absurd. And you know what? I couldn't help but think of one person in the Bible. The one person in the Bible who had it all. Had all the women. Had all the, had all the wealth. Wrote three books. First book he wrote about, he wrote about a girl. Song of Solomon's. And theologians say that he wrote that book earlier on in his life. And he's writing about this girl. And, 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 and it's a profound book. And then his second book he writes, he writes about all the Proverbs, all his collection of some of his most worthy sayings he would collect in this book. And then in his old years, the wisest man in the world sat down, besides Jesus, sat down and wrote Ecclesiastes. And in the final chapter of Ecclesiastes, after reflecting on everything, and we know that because of his lust for power and control that he fell away from God. And then in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 8, he says about life without God, meaningless. Meaningless. Life is utter meaninglessness. He saw nothing meaningless in the world. And in fact, it is true. If we don't have a God, we will move in two directions existentialism where you will have to create meaning for yourself or absurdism look absurdism in the face and challenge it because if you don't challenge the absurdity of life Calmu says that suicide is a result you challenge the absurdity of life and be content with where you are in life he would say do you know the world rotates around the sun and for us, it'll only rotate, generally speaking, only 78 times for you and I, before your time is done. Two ways in which he encountered that. I want to make some suggestions for you today before we leave. Jesus deals with three things that we're looking for in all of this mess. The three things I like to call the three M's. The three what, church? M's. The three M's, if you walk away with anything from today's talk, I want you to remember the three what? Three M's. The first M, meaning. Meaning. Jesus gives our life meaning because he created us. Because we're created. And the belief that we're created it logically follows that there is an essence, there is a purpose for your existence. And if you really believe that Jesus Christ existed, he was on earth, died and was raised again, then it's not illogical for us to come to the logical conclusion that there is meaning in life in the person of Jesus Christ. The second M is morality. Everyone say morality. There is morality. There is morality. But some would say, how do you deal with the issue of evil? How can you say that an all-powerful God, but then there's evil in the world? Well, let me just pause for a second. If there is no evil, then there is no good. But if there is a, such a thing as evil, then there is such a thing as good. And if there is such a thing as good, then there is such a thing as a moral law by which you differentiate what is good and what is evil. 
And if there's a moral law, then there is a moral law giver. And if there's a moral law giver, your life, have, your life has extreme significance. Did you know that evil and suffering in the world is more evidence of a loving God? The fact that it's possible for evil only serves to prove that God is a loving God because you can't have a God that loves but controls everything too. God is not a control freak. I don't know about you, but I love waking up in the morning and hearing my wife say, I love you, and that comes from her heart, not because I programmed her to. And here's the thing, right? Sam Harris, an atheist, Jordan Peterson, I'd say probably an agnostic, looking at each other, debating over morals, debating over communism, and Douglas Murray was the mediator, he was a journalist, and as he was listening, Sam Harris says, it was religion that drove the bloodiest century in the 20th century. It was religion that drove communism. Jordan Peterson, on the other hand, said, actually, it was atheistic. And they argued, atheistic, religion. Religion, atheistic. Douglas Murray was not a Christian. And Douglas Murray says, let me tell you something. Mao, Stalin, Hitler, these men committed these atrocities because they no longer believed that God existed. The idea that God no longer exists, with it goes the intrinsic value of human beings. The last M is mortality. How many M's did I say? Three. Meaning, morality, mortality. There would be no Christianity today if Jesus Christ was still in his grave in Palestine today. There would be no Christianity today if Jesus Christ did not rise. Death is not the end, friends. Death is not the end. Jesus rose from the grave to prove that Jesus has purpose, has a better place, has the power to restore. And you know what's even more interesting is that God did not spare his own son from suffering. He did not spare his own son. You know why most people leave Christianity? Most people leave Christianity today because of the problem of evil and suffering. You know, suffering is a big part of life. It's a big part of life of sin. And God did not take that cup away from Jesus, but allowed Jesus to go through evil and suffering as one of us. James Stewart, the Scottish minister, by the way, born in 1896, died in 1990. This guy died at 94 years old. He wrote these words, beautiful words. He says, It is a glorious phrase that our Lord led captivity captive. The very triumphs of his foes, it means he used for their defeat. He compiled their dark achievements to, sub to subserve their, his ends, not theirs. They nailed him to a tree, not knowing that that tree, by that very act, they were bringing the world to his feet. They gave him a cross, not guessing that he would make it a throne. They flung him outside the gates to die, not knowing that at that very moment they were lifting up all the gates of the universe to let the king of glory come in. They thought to root out his doctrines, not understanding that they were implanting imperishably in the hearts of men the very name they intended to destroy. They thought they had God with his back to the wall, pinned and helpless and defeated. They did not know it was God himself who had tracked them down to that point. He conquered not in spite of the dark mystery of evil, 
He conquered through it. Four things I want to leave with you as we finish today. Evil and suffering. Evil, suffering. Justice, love. Evil, we have to live with the reality that evil exists in this world today. Suffering, whether you're black, white, wealthy, poor, none of us can escape the reality of some type of suffering. We're going to go through some kind of suffering. This is part of this fallen world. Justice, each and every one of us within our hearts. I remember before I was even a Christian, when I was a kid, the one thing I hated more than anything was injustice. How did I measure injustice? The pain, the suffering. I knew something was not right. I knew somebody needed to make this right. There are people that have gone to their graves and have never seen justice. There are people who lived a good life, died tragically, never experienced justice. And then there's love. We all think we know what love is until Jesus came into this world to reveal to us what love is. He doesn't say, love everyone and I leave you with that. He says, love as I loved you. That last part that troubles us. We sit here, we go, yeah, I love but that last part where Jesus says, love as I loved, now we got problems. Because Jesus knew how to love his enemies. Evil, suffering, justice and love. You know where all four of those converged in one time in history? You know where they all converged at one time in history? Calvary. They all came together at Calvary. I leave you with this one text. No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven. Take these words in. The Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have what? For God did not send his world into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Here's the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Evil. Suffering, justice, love, that's the reason for God.